Namaste. So today we want to look at verse 30 of Vichara Sangraham, which is about knowledge of the self. Actually, as far as practice goes, the preceding episode gives everything you need to know about how to practice inquiry, vichara. But the succeeding verses from 30 to 40 give additional instructions that are very useful to perfect this practice. So let's take a look. Devotee, even though the heart and the Brahma Randra alone are the loci fit for meditation, could one meditate, if necessary, on the six mystic centers, chakras or adharas? Maharshi, the six mystic centers, which are said to be the loci of meditation, are but products of imagination. All these are meant for beginners in yoga. With reference to meditation on the six centers, the Shiva yogins say, God, who is of the nature of the non-dual, plenary, consciousness self, manifests, sustains, and resolves us all. It is a great sin to spoil that reality by superimposing on it various names and forms, such as Ganapati, Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Maheshwara, and Sadashiva. And the Vedantins declare, all those are but imaginations of the mind. Therefore, if one knows one's self, which is of the nature of consciousness that knows everything, one knows everything. The great ones have also said, when that one is known as it is in itself, all that has not been known becomes known. If we who are endowed with various thoughts meditate on God, that is the self, we would get rid of the plurality of thoughts by that one thought, and then even that one thought would vanish. This is what is meant by saying that knowing one's self is knowing God. This knowledge is release. So Maharshi is saying here that from his point of view, from the point of view of Ajatavada, the highest level of realization, the chakras are imaginary. And also the names and forms of the various gods are simply imagination. They are superimpositions on the self. And this is also Shankaracharya's view. In fact, his explanation of Vedanta and the self is called the theory of superimposition. And the Buddha calls these same things assets. And he says that Nirvana or Nibbana is reached when one relinquishes all assets. And we call them upadi. Upadi means a covering. Well, what are they covering? The self, the reality, the non-dual beingness. Now let's back up a little. For most of us, the chakras are real because the body is real and the world is real or seen as real. That is the platform of duality and that is where we all start. So in the beginning, yes, we have to meditate on the chakras. We have to meditate on the gods. The name and form of God is viewed as the ultimate object of meditation in bhakti. And devotion to God slowly leads to devotion to the self. And this is the platform of ultimate liberation. 
So like he says here, the chakras are meant for the beginners in yoga, those on the Dvaita Vada platform and the other platforms of duality. Huh? They are not meant for the meditators. They are not meant for the self-realized beings. Why? Because from that point of view, all that is simply a covering, a superimposition on the self. And so it is. But in the beginning, we can't see that. Uh -huh. We see the body, the world, the mind, the ego, all these things as real. This is our disease. In another work of Ramana Maharshi's Uladu Narpadu, the first verse begins with the phrase, because we see the world. Because we see the world and the world appears real, there has to be a creator. And the search for this creator is actually what powers the whole path of self-realization. In the beginning, we project this creator outside of ourselves and we say, oh, it's God. It's God. It's Vishnu or Brahma or Shakti or Shiva. You see? We project the creator. Why? Because we don't think we have the power to create the world. That's all right in the beginning. And developing devotion to these different creators, these different forms of God and so on, is a necessary step. But when one reaches the platform of meditation, Vivartavada, on that platform, we have to accept that only the self is real. Everything else is only an appearance, a mirage, a hallucination, or a dream within the self. They don't actually exist. And this is hinted at in the famous uh, introductory verse to the Ishopanishad. Aum Purnamada Purnamidang Purnat Purnamudachate. Even though so many complete units emanate from the complete source, the complete source is not diminished in any way. How is this possible? Only if those emanations are illusions. Only if the world, the living entities, and even the gods are but projections, dreams, maya, you see? I want to tell you about a dream that I had. <laughs> I'll leave out most of the details because they're just too personal and intimate. But in this dream, Shakti was reading from a book. And the book was about a seaside resort, which looked to be just the example of a bucolic retreat. You know, everybody is young, beautiful, single, and rich. <laughs> and all the buildings are new, and the beach is perfect, and everything is just right. But the whole thing is actually just a front for a mysterious corporation that has all kinds of evil designs. So she was reading me this book and I said, oh, that's the secret. The world looks like a paradise, a place of enjoyment, a resort. 
but it's actually a place of exploitation, a place of suffering and punishment, a prison house. That's the secret. See, this was Maya herself telling me this is the actual nature of the world. And why? Well, it has to be that way. Because if the world were real, and if it were actually paradise, and if there was actually enjoyment, then there would be no incentive to ever leave it. If the world were permanent instead of temporary, if our identities and our bodies were eternal, then why would anyone do meditation or, or seva? Why would anyone try to get uh, liberation? You see? But she knows very well that the whole thing is a trap. First of all, it's illusory. And anything that we build up here is going to be lost. So this causes immense suffering. And then the, the living entity has to go through lifetimes after lifetimes, chasing these desires, looking for a permanent home that doesn't exist. See, and this is the nefarious purpose behind the suffering in the material world. It's actually for our benefit. It's a goad. The form of the goddess, Ambal, carries an elephant goad. Well, what does she need an elephant goad for? She's not an elephant uh, rider. It's symbolic. It signifies the suffering in the material world that pushes the living beings eventually to seek liberation. And now here in this verse, is a liberated being, a Jivan Mukta, giving us the key. This is how you attain it. You hold the thought, I am the self, Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. I am the self. Or I am Shiva, Shiva Hung. And by holding this thought, one defeats all the other thoughts, because all other thoughts are nothing compared with this. This is the greatest thought possible. And then, once the unity of the mind is attained, all the other thoughts disappear. Even that thought. And one is left with a perfectly pellucid, calm, and steady mind. A very firm understanding of the reality. A very great knowledge. As Bhagavad Gita says, that knowledge, knowing which, there is nothing further to be known. And this is the pinnacle of self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.